in there. Although this talk, this seminar is also aims to be accessible to graduate students. It, we don't always succeed, again, with the exception of Gus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, that's three minutes after, and I'm very happy, fresh from us. Uh, from uh, freshly arrived from down under, our very mm -hmm. own Gus Schrader speaking directly to you from Chicago, Illinois. That's, uh, All right, thanks, Andre, for the uh, yeah for the for the great introduction. Um, so yeah, so the topic of my talk today um, is something called um, bi fundamental backstore operators. Um, and maybe before I kind of get going, is everybody able to see kind of the screen yeah. where I'm right there. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I think so. Cool. All right. So um, what are these bifundamental backstore operators? Um, um, well, they're some kind of uh, technical devices that have shown up recently in a couple of different areas. And you can kind of have a clue as to, to what those areas are by, by the name. Um, so the, the word bifundamental uh, refers to a context in which these guys appear, which is that of um, 3D gauge theories. With bifundamental matter. And um, the word Baxter should probably clue you into the fact that they have something to do with integrable systems. And uh, the kind of particular class of integrable systems um, to which they're connected is so-called open TODA, um, open TODA chain. So um, I've like very often given talks about um, the blue and the red topic uh, separately. Um, and I've somehow always managed, to, including in this seminar, and I've somehow always managed to run out of time um, before being able to give a kind of um, reasonable, understandable treatment of what these biofundamental backstory operators are. I've always kind of treated them as a black box in every talk I've given on the subject. And it's always kind of um, felt a little bit frustrating to me because I think that they're, they're actually kind of, um, well, to me, they're, they're interesting and a little bit mysterious as well. Um, and so hopefully um, uh, some members of the audience can perhaps help to shed light on a little bit of the um, seeming mystery. Okay, so so that's what I want to focus on in the talk. Really, the kind of nuts and bolts of what these what these operators are. Um, and to sort of begin is kind of a real talk, um, is uh, kind of with talking about this open total chain uh, for the group PLN, and the risky part is I'm going to um, uh, describe it. Uh, via cluster algebras. So sort of seems like a terrible idea to begin a talk by launching into a discussion of cluster algebras, um, but let me try and make it kind of go down as smoothly as possible. Um, and I hope it, it, it won't be too bad and hopefully I can convince you that the kind of formalism is not um, too contrived and full of impossible to remember formulas. Okay, so uh, what is the kind of input data we need um, to define the cluster algebra? Well, that data is a just a free lambda uh, together with a skew symmetric bilinear form. Uh, let me call this guy round brackets, um, bullet comma bullet. Um, so we have a lattice, uh, skew symmetric bilinear form on the lattice, and we also need an additional piece of data to kind of get the wheels of the cluster algebra machinery moving, which is a basis, a choice of a particular basis in that lattice. Okay, so if uh, E1 up to E, the rank of the lattice, is a basis. Basis. Uh, for the lattice. Uh, then we get a quiver, just to say a directed graph, and what are the vertices of this directed graph? The vertices are just the elements of our basis. 
the EI from one up to the rank. And what are the arrows in our quiver? Well, the number of arrows in our quiver pointing from basis vector EI to basis vector EJ, this is just equal to the value of our schismetric bomb on the um, corresponding pair of basis vectors. And because this form is symmetric, this means, you know, as you would expect, the number of arrows from either j is equal to negative the number of directed arrows from j to i. Okay, um, so, so let me give an example um, of such a, a, a setup, which is gonna be important for us in the talk. Um, so let's write p for the root lattice of the general linear group um, GLN and um, P check for the co-root lattice of the same group. And we're gonna take our lattice lambda just to be the direct sum. Okay, and now uh, what is our skew symmetric uh, form gonna be given by? What we're gonna declare um, that the uh, value of the form on some basis vector corresponding to a root alpha and a basis vector corresponding to some root, you know, uh, beta check, we're just going to declare this to be the, you know, canonical, the val evaluation of beta check on, on alpha. Okay. Um, and this completely defines the, um, by the skew symmetry completely defines the, uh, this skew symmetric bilinear form. All right, um, and we also have a natural candidate for a basis for lambda. Uh, and that basis is just the one where we, so the root lattice is the lattice um, spanned uh, by the simple uh, roots, and similarly for the co-root lattice. So let's just take those um, simple roots. Um, and uh, simple co roots. I think it's minus one and minus one. No? Ah, yeah, thanks. Um, so let's do GLN plus one. Good. Um, cool. So uh, we have a natural basis like that. Um, and this should be enough to get us started to produce some cluster algebra. Okay, so I said um, that we can um, encapsulate this, um, um, this data by a quiver. So let me draw a picture of the quiver, or perhaps more accurately, let me copy a picture of the quiver that I've already drawn. Sorry for jumping around. Um, so the quiver looks uh, something like this. Uh, and remember these arrows are just encoding the kind of Cartan matrix of, um, in this case, TL4, um, right? So we have th these pair of th these two arrows here uh, indicating the fact that alpha one check alpha one is two. And these are, uh, oops, um, These arrows here indicating the, the fact that the um, other uh, alpha one but alpha two check is, is negative one. So, okay, good. Um, so, uh, so that's the kind of initial cluster um, in our cluster algebra. And now I have to say a word or two about mutation. Um, and what this mutation is, uh, so basically for each, direction um, in our basis. So for each um, k between one and the rank of the, of the lattice, um, we're going to define um, some computation in direction k. And it's just a rule uh, for how to produce a new basis from our initial one. Um,
So you have some new basis EI prime um, from initial one consisting of the EIs. And um, this rule is really the kind of only, um, at least the way I'll present it, ad hoc piece of this cluster story. Um, everything else kind of comes out of, of here. And that rule is also not very hard to remember. Um, so the new basis uh, vectors are related to the old ones in the following way. So if we're mutating in direction K, um, then the K basis vector just acquires a negative sign in the new basis. Um, and otherwise, um, the i basis vector kind of undergoes a shearing in the direction of the, the k basis vector. And the kind of coefficient in that shearing, um, what is it? Well, it's the maximum of zero and the evaluation of the skew form of ei with ek. So we have this integer times um, ek. All right, so in other words, if you have some vertex which uh, is pointing into another vertex that's mutating, it will acquire a, a, a shear um, um, under the mutation. Okay, um, great. So, um, and obviously this produces um, as well, we get a new quiver. Um, because the, the, the map um, sending EI our old basis to our new basis, um, this is not um, an isometry of the, of the skew form. So the quiver is going to change um, when we replace our original basis by this sheared, sheared one. Um, and this recovers if you trace it through this usual kind of Byzantine looking combinatorial definition of how to mutate a, a quiver. Um, all right. Um, so the uh, next thing we want to do um, in this uh, setup um, is from our lattice and our skew symmetric form, there's another very natural kind of algebraic gadget we can produce, uh, which is this sort of Q um, while algebra or, or Q torus algebra. So let's call this fellow T for torus, subscript lambda for the lattice. Um, and okay, so what is this thing just as an abelian group? Well, it's just the group ring of the uh, lattice lambda uh, with coefficients in uh, Laurent Pont integer value, integer coefficient Laurent polynomials in some indeterminate uh, Q. And the uh, so it looks just an abelian group like the group ring. And the multiplication also looks an awful lot like the multiplication in the group ring of the lattice. Um, so we have some you know, uh, generators for this thing sort of that are like X sub lambda where lambda uh, runs over the whole lattice. And in the usual group ring, the rule for how to multiply two of these guys would be, well, multiply X lambda times X mu. It's the group ring. So this is just X subscript lambda plus mu. And in this Q torus, we're gonna use this additional data we have of the um, our skew symmetric form to deform these relations in the following way. We're going to depending on Q, the value of the lambda mu. Um, Non-commutative um, uh, associative algebra and um, it has some nice kind of representations that we'll be interested in. Um, it's it's pretty, pretty simple algebra and has some pretty simple representations. Um, and to describe these representations, let me, uh, rather than sort of, um, so, so what's the motto of the seminar, like minimal generality, right? So, so let me um, describe them in the particular example of the one we just discussed where our, um, And so an example that our lattice is built by kind of taking some of the uh, root and co-root lattices for GLN. Um, and the uh, quiver looks 
uh, like the one that we saw earlier. So now the representation, um, so it's gonna act on, let's call this representation H for sort of Hilbert space. Um, and our Hilbert space in this case is just going to be the, um, uh, if you like the group ring of the uh, uh, root lattice. Um, so this thing explicitly is a Laurent um, polynomial ring um, in the simple root. So GLN plus one. So just Laurent polynomial ring. And uh, we let, um, so on this thing, we have to make this torus, um, quantum torus act. This quantum torus has generators. It look like, you know, X sub alpha A and X sub alpha I check. How are we gonna let them act? Well, we're gonna let X sub alpha I, um, we let X sub alpha I act by multiplication. On that, uh, on that representation H. And, and uh, we let alpha I act by some sort of difference operator, some sort of Q difference operator. And the way it's gonna act is X alpha I check. It's gonna act on, so what are elements of the silver space? So we can think of them as like functions of polynomial functions in the in these X variables. And um, the result of applying this X alpha I check is now that the, uh, the J if one of these, um, X, the coordinate X sub alpha J is now gonna pick up a quantum scaling factor, Q to the um, alpha I check, alpha J times. All right, um, and pretty straightforward to see that this gives us a representation of the um, corresponding quantum torus. Okay, um, so now um, uh, we uh, want to kind of make sense of um, what cluster mutation uh, means in terms of this representation. Um, and um, so let me kind of sketch out how one can, can do that. Um, so this is sort of a bit strange. It's kind of like an analytic part of the story. Um, so, um, so yeah, is what it is. So because it's this sort of analytic part of the story, we're now gonna suppose uh, that our kind of quantum parameter Q, our definition parameter in the quantum torus, is, is no longer like a formal variable, but actually like a uh, complex number um, on the unit circle. We'll parameterize it as um, e to the pi i times h bar for some real, uh, real h bar. Okay, and now the kind of key player in defining the quantum mutation or defining the, what the mutation means in the representation is a special function called the day of style logarithm. And there's a bunch of ways to say what this function is. Let's first give it a name, so function phi of a single variable z. Um, and it's the, the kind of cleanest way to say what it is at least up to a, an overall scalar is that it's a solution of a pair of Q difference equations. Um, it's a solution of a pair of difference equations. Uh, the, and the first of these um, says that um, phi of Q squared Z is equal to one plus QZ times phi of Z. And the second one says the same thing but with a different step size of the shift Q. So instead of shifting by this Q, which is e to the pi over H bar, we're gonna shift by um, Q check, where Q check is this kind of um, modular dual quantum parameter e to the pi I over H bar. Okay, um, so this is, that's the FIDE function. And then um, to, uh, each mutation in direction, whatever direction we have. 
So remember these directions are parameterized by um, elements of whatever basis we have. So if we want to mutate in the direction of basis vector E sub K, we're going to associate um, an automorphism Oops, weird, sorry about that. Um, an automorphism, um, okay, so, so again, um, this is because this um, Fadea function is not some kind of polynomial function, this um, action by it is not gonna preserve this kind of uh, um, space of polynomials in the uh, root coordinates. So instead we're gonna have to uh, kind of complete um, um, our uh, representation. So this is the, um, the L2 completion uh, with respect to the kind of higher measure on the, on the torus, which is the product of all of the D X alpha I over X alpha I. Um, so okay, we have to do this funny L2 completion. Um, um, again, it is, is what it is. Um, and the automorphism um, is given by um, the uh, taking this corresponding um, operator x sub ek, um, applying the um, uh, uh, Fedeyev's quantum dialogarithm to it, uh, and then this gives us actually a unitary. Um, Automorphism of this L2 completed open space. Um, okay. Again, don't worry too much about the um, analytic uh, subtleties of all this. So, sort of suffice to say is that uh, for each uh, direction in which we might want to mutate, we get uh, some kind of automorphism of our representation space. Okay. So now we have all the ingredients in place that we need to uh, describe the GLN. Um, or I guess I suppose GLN plus one, um, the way we've been labeling things, uh, total chain. Okay, so in order to, to do this, uh, we're going to uh, take our running example, which is our lattice consisting of the uh, direct sum of root and co root lattices of GLN plus one, and we're going to join to it. Um, an additional basis vector. Okay, so um, let me again, sorry to, to sort of jump around. Um, let me grab a copy of this guy from earlier. Okay, so so we've um, adjo adjoined an additional basis vector that I'll call E sub zero. Um, and the, uh, we need to say uh, what the skew symmetric form, uh, what value is taken by the skew symmetric form when we plug in uh, this new basis vector and some other basis vector. And you can see from the way that I've drawn it on the quiver that the only non-zero pairings we get are that E zero with E alpha one is equal to one. And this is also, um, we also have that um, E alpha one check with E zero is, is equal to one. So these are the only non-zero, three non-zero um, involving our new guy, E sub zero. Okay, um, right. So now notice that something kind of interesting has has happened, um, which is before, um, uh, when we had the skew symmetric form on P plus P check, that skew symmetric form basically by construction was non-degenerate. Um, but now we have a skew symmetric form on a lattice of odd rank. So it's, um, it has, has to become degenerate. Um, Um, 
So now this form has a kernel. Uh, and what it means on the level of representations is now we get a one parameter family. Um, of uh, representations. Um, okay, let me call, um, uh, you know, give a name to this thing. So lambda tilde for our old lambda directs um, our new E sub zero. So this can degenerate on lambda tilde um, and the quantum torus uh, T lambda tilde now has this one parameter family of representations parameterized by um, uh, what color should I use for this thing? Maybe green, is green visible? Um, so it's gonna be labeled by some complex number of, let's call it Z. Um, and uh, we're gonna let all of the uh, generators except for the new one act the same, the same way they did before in the old representation. And we just have to say, um, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, right. So, so it's still true um, that just as vector spaces, each of these representations looks like functions on the root lattice. So just uh, uh, this Laurent polynomial ring. And we're going to let the, um, all the old generators act exactly as they used to. And we just have to say now how the new generator acts. And that new generator um, is um, going to act. Well, you can see what it has to act by just from the kind of uh, looking at the quiver, right? It's going to have to act by uh, x omega 1 plus omega 1 check, where these things are the fundamental weight and fundamental co-weight um, respectively, because you know we need the, um, because of the fact that omega i alpha j check is equal to, you know, one if i and j are the same and zero otherwise, right? So e sub zero is gonna have to act by e sub, x sub omega one plus omega one check. Um, but now we have this additional freedom of, um, scaling it by Z and we really get inequivalent representations when we um, include that uh, extra scaling factor. Okay. Um, Question. Yeah. Like if instead of JLM to Toda, I had some other Lie algebra Toda, what would be mm -hmm. that extra thing? Yeah. Good question. Um, it's something I have not, and Sasha I believe have not thought a great deal about, but I think to leave Di Francesco and Renard Kadem have, um, have uh, calculated, have, yeah, some calculations um, that fit into the pattern of what I'm about to describe. Um, yes, but so yeah. far, whatever you said so far can be generalized to any to any type. Of Except for the addition of this. Well, well, yeah, you're right. I, I guess you just say like take the sum of the first and I think fundamental co-root and... vertexes is, is is what you've written, I believe. But yeah, I wouldn't bet my head on it. But yeah, different chess can yeah. have. I mean, you can certainly do that. I, I just don't know if it gives you, if it's going to, um, if what I'm about to say is going to continue to be true for such a thing. Yeah, what, a what, thing. what is the first fundamental? I don't understand what's, what's the first. Uh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> so so like, like, it's just my enumeration of the Dinkin diagram, right? So I've, uh, I mean, it's either the first or the, the last, right? The, the guy that pairs with alpha one Oh, 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 sorry. So you mean because of the GL weights versus the SO weights? Yeah. Right. No, so, I mean, if for a general Lie algebra, what does it mean first? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, right. Um, no, 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 no. I think you can always say that, right? Just take the dual basis to the, to the co roots. Right? Like, can't you just always take the, well, like, how to say it, right? In, in P check. Just take the the basis which evaluates to like delta rj on the basis in p. Can you just use that thing? All right, I think I think I think it's okay. I think you continue with your uh, okay your yeah. plan, and then we can. Good. Good. Um, all right. Um, Good, so um, we've done this funny thing of kind of um, adding this additional um, uh, vertex to our, um, 
to a quiver or suspected to a lattice. Um, and now um, I want to make kind of a few uh, observations. Um, so, so the first observation I want to make is that this quiver, uh, let me again just to get it all kind of on the same page. Let me copy and paste it down here. I guess they need this. Um, so this new quiver where we've sort of added on this, this handle um, has what's called a period. Um, so what I mean by that is there's a sequence of mutations. Um, so actually when I perform those that sequence of mutations to that quiver, I have a new quiver, which is identical to the old one up to a relabeling of the basis vector. So up to the action of the permutation matrix. Um, and let me describe for you. Um, okay, so let, let's say this initial quiver is, uh, Q is not a good choice. I don't know what to call it. Um, I don't know, gamma or something um, for graph. So, so imagine we start off with gamma, which is this thing. Now I claim that, um, so we have our gamma. Now I claim that if we do, and, and let's sort of enumerate the uh, vertices of this quiver in the following way. So I'm gonna enumerate the new one I've added as the first vertex. And then I'm gonna walk backwards along this kind of zigzag path where I'm always tracing backwards along arrows until I've traversed all of the nodes and I'm gonna enumerate them that way. So it goes zero, so it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And now I claim that if I mutate in that uh, successively in that order. So I do mu one, mu two, all the way up to mu six, mu seven. Then I get something which is just a permutation of my original quiver. Okay, so now I want to kind of use like the full um, uh, power of Zoom to hopefully um, convince you that this is in fact true. Um, so let me see if I can do this. Let me stop sharing on here and start sharing on here. So, so yeah, unfortunately, Apple doesn't have, allow a Java runtime for iPads because I think they think it's like a security threat or something. Um, so I'll have to switch between screens. Anyway, so, so is everybody able to see um, a different screen now with some graph on it? Yes. Cool. All right. So. Um, Ah, and except that's not the one I want. Um, I want this one. All right, so so hopefully this looks uh, like the graph that I was just showing you guys. Um, uh, and the vertices are enumerated the same way. So we start from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, along this uh, zigzag path. And now I'm gonna mutate it each of them in turn and we're gonna see what happens. So let's mutate it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And lo and behold, you see all that's happened is our things has kind of been rotated around um, um, and our handle sort of popped out the other side. Um, so uh, we really do get a, uh, up to a relabeling of the variables in uh, the same quiver after we've done this. Okay, so that's that demonstration done. Let me now come back to um, the actual talk. So, uh, so that's the first observation. This quiver has this um, period. And uh, uh, now um, that sort of leads us to a definition of the, right. And obviously the same pattern holds for any GLN, not just GL4 as we, as we drew. So the GLN plus one Baxter operator is the corresponding Uh, product of uh, the day of that logarithms. Okay, so some automorphism of this L2 completion of our representation space that we get by composing successively the um, uh, the day of that logarithms corresponding to each of the mutations in the in the chain. Um, Okay, let's call this, give this thing a name. Let's call it Q, um, uh, we'll write a lower subscript um, 
n plus one to indicate which TL we're talking about. Um, and I'll also indicate this dependence on the, um, the kind of uh, this one parameter uh, deformation of the, of the representation um, that we call Z. Okay, so, so we can, re if, if, we, if we want, we can kind of switch perspective and think that we, this is like a one parameter uh, family of, you know, automorphisms. of our L2 completed um, uh, representation space. Question. Yeah. Uh, how would Baxter recognize his operator in this definition? Right, so, so let me, um, that is literally what I'm about to say next. Um, so so that there's two main properties that, the, that Baxter's Baxter operator satisfies, right? First one of these, I'll put as, as the next observation, um, is that this, Okay, so, so this in back to the original operator, there's always this kind of spectral parameter like this thing Z. And the first important property is that the Baxter operators commute at different values of the spectral parameter. And that's certainly true of these guys here. Um, so Q of Z uh, commutes with Q of W for any values of Z and W. And there's a, another, um, a uh, crucial property of the um, Baxter operator, which is what's called the TQ relation. And what this TQ relation typically does is it relates this Q operator to, well, something called a T operator. And what the T operator is, is something that um, encodes the, the transfer matrix, so, so the Hamiltonians of an integrable model. And um, what kind of, so that's what T and Q stand for in the TQ. What, what, what kind of relation is it? Well, it's um, a, some kind of, you know, difference slash differential, depending what kind of integral model you're talking about, slash Q difference um, uh, relation. And for us, um, this TQ relation is going to take the following form. So it's going to say that Q of, um, now let's scale my um, spectral parameter Z uh, by Q. Um, um, and then let's multiply um, on the right by the inverse of the Q operator with the original spectral parameter. And what this TQ relation says is that this thing is a polynomial of degree so if it's for TL n, it's going to be a polynomial of degree n and we in the spectral parameter. So we can expand it out. Um, and collect the coefficients. And these coefficients are a bunch of um, uh, Q difference operators. On our, uh, on our representation H. So now th these Q difference operators make sense on our, even on our uncompleted uh, representation. It's the original one we started from. Um, and, um, by observation uh, two, um, this collection of um, uh, so this gives us n um, minus one commuting um, because the q is commuted with each other at different values of the spectral parameter uh, q difference operators on this. Um, ring of Laurent polynomials in the GLN um, uh, root less. So in other words, we get um, a quantum integrable system um, uh, and this quantum integrable system is what's known as the open um, GLN 
Toyota. Okay. Right, so, so I guess in answer to the um, um, Andreas question, you could rightfully call this thing here something like the transfer matrix of the um, of this open Toyota system and satisfies this sort of TQ type solution, which is much simpler than the kind of things people normally call TQ relations, where you'd where to be some kind of um, uh, you'd have three um, terms appearing rather than just two. So, yeah, you're sort of a, you can think of it as a degeneration of the of the usual. But I okay. think yeah. more uh, in the more technical terms, usually, mm -hmm. usually people. So if you have um, if you have this this uh, you know, there, suppose you diagonalize your your all your Hamiltonians, right? So there will be uh, functions yeah. mm -hmm. of some uh, of some uh, beta roots, whatever called the beta yep. roots, something. Mm -hmm. And usually you call the Baxter operator the operator for which the um, the eigenvalues of Q of Z, it's like the like a product of Z minus the beta roots or something. Uh, yeah, Andrew, you, uh, yeah, you, that, you, you keep you keep stealing my my thunder. So, oh, um, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, I apologize. Your talk must be complete. Like, like any anyone would think I've like, I planted you with these with these questions to yeah <laughs> remind me of what to say next. But anyway, so yeah, so Andre's comment um, uh, beautifully leads me into what in my notes is observation number four. Um, uh, which is kind of solution of the spectral problem for this this open total chain. Um, so these, so we now we've um, all right. So, so let's kind of like take a step back for a second and just think about what's happened. So just starting from this kind of um, cluster ish perspective, um, and this notion of what a quantum mutation is, we've produced this um, commuting family of of Toyota Hamiltonians. And um, now uh, I want to describe the joint um, uh, set of eigenfunctions. And this can actually also be done using these uh, Baxter operators, um, uh, but it's a, sort of a bit of a uh, long story, which I don't, unfortunately don't really have the time to go into. So let me just sort of say the result, um, which is that um, this, um, these, Toyota Hamiltonians have joint eigenfunctions. You can actually, yeah, construct them explicitly using these backstroke operators. Um, and let me call these guys psi, sort of wave function. Um, now they depend on some kind of momentum variable. So like beta, like quasi, what was it called? Um, I think it was called in beta ansatz, but I should have gone to the student seminar. Um, so psi sub lambda of x, um, where this x is a coordinate on the root uh, lattice as usual, and the lambda is now in um, r to the n, and it labels the eigenvalues. Right, so it's an open chain, so you expect sort of continuous spectrum, and it's indeed what, um, what, you, what you get. Um, and so these eigenfunctions are what's called Whitaker functions. Um, and what you might call, I guess, Q comma Q check Whitaker functions, simultaneously good for the Toyota system with Q and that with Q check. Um, and uh, these uh, joint eigenfunctions are also eigenfunctions for the Baxter operator. So, Q of Z acting on psi lambda uh, is equal to the product. And K is equal to one up to N, again, so the GLN, um, psi of Z over lambda K times psi of lambda. Okay, so, so I think this is the kind of, um, relation you perhaps had in mind. Is that right, Andrew? Yeah, right. Except you know, usually instead of five, I have some very simple function like- Exactly, one sure. Minus the variable, yeah. Yeah, is... right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one more question about key mm -hmm. operators. Uh, yeah. Sh should, should, we, should we a priori expect that these key operators defined as a sequence of mutations be computing, or this is just matter of check. 
Yeah, good question. So it's a matter of check, but the check is pretty easy. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's basically a consequence of this um, famous um, Pentagon identity uh, for the dialogue rhythm. So, so this thing here follows from from pentagon relation for the the phi function. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty easy uh, um, consequence of that. Good. Okay. Um, great. So, um, so this is all um, um, well and good, um, and kind of an explanation of, uh, you know, the, the Baxter half of why I call these guys, um, why the title of my talk was Biofundamental Baxter Operators. Um, so in order to get to the biofundamental part, I wanna kind of explain another, um, another incarnation. So sort of draw a line under that for, um, the time being. Um, actually, maybe let me put a box around this formula because we'll want to compare to it later on. Okay, so, so kind of another incarnation um, of the quiver that we built by, sorry again to jump around. Let me make another copy of this guy. Another incarnation of this quiver we got by kind of sticking this extra hat on top of our original um, quiver built from the root and co-root lattices. Um, so what is that? Um, where else does this thing show up in nature? Well, let me now say a bunch of kind of fancy words and I'll spend a decent chunk of the rest of the talk explaining what they mean. So it describes the cluster structure that we already have some sense of what it might mean on the Coulomb branch of the moduli space of vacua. Um, in a certain 3D n equals four supersymmetric gauge theory. Um, and which one of these is it? Um, well, I should first tell you what the gauge group is. Um, so the gauge group uh, G, is gonna be GLN cross GL1. And the matter content um, is gonna be in the bifundamental representation of this, this uh, product of general linear groups, which is to say it's just um, CN tensored with um, C dual, or if you like, home from C. C to the N. Okay, um, so I'll say, um, based on how things are going time-wise, I hope substantially more about um, what this means. Um, but at the uh, very least, it suggests a natural generalization of the picture we've, we've seen already, uh, which is to um, uh, consider um, The case when now um, the gauge group G is GLN cross some arbitrary GLM. And again, the matter is in the um, uh, by fundamental representation. Okay, so, so again, um, there's a cluster structure. And let me draw a picture of you uh, for you of the quiver that describes that cluster structure. So it's glued um, from uh, kind of a GLN total quiver and a GLM total quiver um, in the following way. Okay, so let me label um, who's who. So um, here we have um, E alpha one, E alpha two, 
up to say E alpha M minus one. And then we have the checks on the other side of one, I went write them. And then down here, we have um, E alpha N minus one all the way down to E alpha one. And then in the middle we have, you know, whatever you need to put in there to make those uh, adjacencies correct. What about if you have several copies of this matter? Then there'll be some number of these dots in the middle? Right, yeah, that, that's right. There's like a combinatorial rule for how to, um, for, for any, um, yeah, um, for any quiver gauge theory, how to produce the um, corresponding cluster electro quiver. But yeah, so somehow everything can be, well, yeah, in some sense boiled down to kind of treat each, each, each of these dots in the middle kind of separately and, and so forth. Okay, but, but for this talk, I'm just going to focus on this simple case where, um, again, of minimal generality, where we just have GLN cross GLM as our gauge group and um, the single copy of the bifundamental representation of C as a matter. Um, okay, so the fun thing is that um, this quiver also has a period. Um, which is, um, but it's a little bit kind of harder to see um, than the nice easy one we, we uh, looked at earlier. Um, so um, in order to see it, um, uh, we're gonna have to kind of unwrap this quiver or sort of unroll quiver on um, a cylinder. So let me illustrate what I mean by enrolling it on a cylinder in the case, um, some reasonably small case of let's say GL2 um, cross GL3. All right, so now let me again um, cheat a bit and copy a picture I drew earlier to save on a bit of time. Um, okay. So let me paste that in here. Cool. Okay, so for GL2 cross GL3, um, what do we have? Um, well, our quiver, um, we said is glued out of two pieces. Up here, we have a piece um, corresponding to GL3 um, root and co root lattices. And down here, we have a similar thing for um, GL2. Uh, and now what I want to do is kind of unwrap this thing on the on the sort of um, cylinder in the um, following way. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enumerate the vertices in this quiver um, again using these kind of zigzag type paths, and in the top piece of the quiver I'm going to follow the zigzag path forward. So I start at one at the very top source, then I go two, three four, and I come to this kind of joining place five. And then on the other side, because the representation is like the dual on the other side, I follow the, um, the zigzag path backwards. So I go five, six, seven to enumerate. Um, okay. And then um, we, we take this picture and we unwrap it on the torus, um, on the cylinder in the following way. Um, so the kind of um, direction of periodicity is obviously like this. And in this top row, we have, um, uh, this uh, things that project to vertex one, in the second row, things that project to vertex two, third row, vertex three, uh, so on and so forth, all the way down. Okay, so we have this thing kind of universal cover, if you like, of this, this original quiver. Um, and I'm going to take a 2n minus one by 2m minus one, where n and m are the n and m from GLN cross GLN, kind of fundamental domain inside of this universal cover. So that's what I've tried to illustrate being inside this green uh, rectangle. Okay, so in this case, it's a uh, three by five um, uh, fundamental domain that we have. And there's a, another feature um, of this the sort of decoration onto this unrolling, I want to put, uh, which is kind of a checkerboard uh, pattern on the, um, on the, uh, on the elements of, on this universal cover. 
right? So uh, because it's kind of hard to shade on the iPad and still have numbers be visible, I've indicated this checkerboard business by drawing a circle around some of the, uh, a blue circle around some of the, um, oops, didn't mean to erase that, some, some of the uh, vertices on the inversal cover and no blue circle around others. Okay, so I hope the pattern is, well, the subjective pattern is, is relatively clear. And, okay, so sort of a fair bit of combinatorics to swallow, but again, sort of is what it is. Uh, and let me now describe to you um, what the period is. So, so what are we going to do? We're going to mutate at, um, every uh, uh, vertex in uh, the domain in the green rectangle. But remember because mutation corresponds to Fedeyev's style logarithm applied to an element of this quantum torus, it really matters what order you do it in, what, what order you do these sequences of mutations in. Um, so let me explain to you what that order is. Um, um, so first of all, we're gonna go um, by sort of columns, by sort of vertical columns um, from left to right. Um, and then within each column, the columns of the rectangle. Um, so we're gonna first mutate at all um, blue circled vertices uh, from starting from the bottom, going up to the top, and then do the remainder from top to bottom. And so that's the rule. Uh, so let me illustrate it by um, figuring out where we are supposed to mutate um, here. So we start in the first column, which is where you have this five. It's a blue square, uh, that, uh, a blue circle, that's easy. We go to the next column where we have this four and this six. So we first do the blue square, which is six. And then we do the non-blue square, which is four. In the next column, we have to do the blue guys, uh, seven and three from bottom to top. So we do seven, three, and five. Uh, then in the next column, we have to do the blue circle four, and then two and six. Um, from uh, top to bottom. And then we have five, one, three, two, four, three. Okay, so now um, let me again um, switch screens briefly um, and demonstrate that this guy is actually a period. Um, so, All right, so here's the quiver we just saw. Um, and now let's mutate at the uh, places I just described. So, um, so we have to start by doing, um, by mutating at uh, five, then six, four, then seven, three, five, uh, four, two, six, uh, one, three, two, four, uh, three. Oops. It looks like I made, all right. Let's start over. So uh, five, six, four, uh, seven, three, Five, four, two, six, five, one, three, two, four, three. Oh. <laughs> All right, let me look in my five, six, four, seven, three, five, four, two, six. Five, 
Uh, oh, I think I see what happened. I number these guys wrong. So yeah, my apologies. So right, so what I did wrong is that, remember how I said that when you number the vertices in the bottom part, part of the quiver, you have to follow the zigzag path backwards rather than forwards because um, uh, it's the dual representation. So now with, and so now you see we go five, six, seven, so you go backwards. So now let's try it again, but um, hopefully correctly. So we'll do five, six, four, uh, seven, three, five, four, two, six, five, one, three, two, four, Three. Ah, I'm going to give this one more go, and if it doesn't work, you're just going to have to take my word for it. So we said that, yeah. All right, this now looks um, correct. So let's see five, six, four. Um, Seven, three, five, four, two, six, uh, five. Oh, did that actually? Yeah, six, um, five, one, three, two, four. Great. Yay, success. OK, so after you know, a bunch you, of misclick. <laughs> you know, Gus, I mean, you can circumvent both uh, the running of Java and this issues by by pre-recording the video of, this, of the That's click true. Then... Yeah, maybe that's the real solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, hopefully this, this has demonstrated two things, um, which is that this quiver really does have a period. And secondly, the, the, this period is like pretty bizarre kind of thing um, that is um, kind of mysterious. So let me now turn off this screen sharing and go back to the, the other one. Um, Gus, may, may I ask uh, in your beautiful demonstration, is it true yeah. that you mutate uh, on the four valent vertices? That you correct. You only, you only mutate in four valent vertices. That oh. is correct. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. All right. So let's stop sharing there and go back to sharing here. Um, cool. OK. Um, so the question, which um, um, is pretty natural at this point, is where on earth does this come from? How would one ever can um, dream up such a bar sequence of mutations that kind of um, uh, preserves this quiver? Um, so I want to give kind of two answers. Um, uh, one kind of an analytic type answer and one kind of a geometric type answer. Um, so the analytic answer is the following thing. It comes from a, a Whittaker identity, Whittaker function identity. Um, and uh, what that Whittaker function identity says is that, okay, so, so let's call this period Give us a name. Um, um, call the corresponding um, operator. Um, now Q depending on N for GLN and M for GLM. So now some operator on the uh, tensor product Hilbert space. And it satisfies an identity, um, an eigenvalue identity with the Whittaker functions. So now it acts on the product 
of a GLN um, Whittaker function with eigenvalue label lambda times a GL M Whittaker function with eigenvalue mu. Um, and the eigenvalue of this big product of 2n minus 1 times 2m minus 1 dilogarithms, it's our rectangular product, um, i running from 1 up to n, j running from 1 up to m. Now, for Dave's function evaluated at mu j over lambda i, so this is the eigenvalue, you almost miss the eigenvalue, um, and then. Um, that's the thing is multiplying the arithmetic. That's to depend on z, no? One. Um, so now instead of one z, we have like m z's, which are like the um, coordinates on torus of GLM. Oh, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so so before the old, I should have I should have made a more coherent notation, right? But the old um, z. This is like mu one for GL one. Um, right. Okay. So, um, so that's one answer, um, and that this answer is actually how we came to this operator in the first place, um, which is that we 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 took this operator of multiplication, multiplication operator, and we computed this Whittaker transform, um, and we got this funny sequence of mutations Q n comma M. Um, so uh, um, one way one would sort of discover this, this stuff, um, but there's another answer um, that I think is- I have a question about that part. So um, how would you, is there some, yeah. you know, a little bit hands-off way to say what that sequence is? Is that sequence, uh, you know, of course, you gave an explicit description, yeah, sure. but but it's yep, uh, yep. But... right. So, so, so in general, um, for a quiver, there is something which may or may not exist called the Donaldson Thomas, the cluster Donaldson Thomas transformation for that quiver. Um, it's characterized by what it does to the tropical cluster variables attached to the initial seed. Namely, it sends each of those to just its its reciprocal, um, and this thing is the cluster Donaldson Thomas and Donaldson Thomas. Um, Invariant for this this quiver, so that's kind of like the one sentence I just say what it is. But but in general, there's no guarantee such a thing even exists for a general quiver, and if it does, there's no recipe to kind of um, write it down, unfortunately. But but can you think of is uh, is there some way to think about so there's a you know a sequence of mutation is like a you know is a path in some complicated graph. Is mm -hmm. uh is there a way to talk about this in slightly um, in some other language, which is not, uh, which is Hopefully. not the, like yeah. naming, naming every step of that way. Right, right. Um, I, I would hope so. Um, and if anybody has any ideas about how one might do that, I'd be very interested to hear. But yeah, I mean, this stuff is, what, what, what do people say? This stuff is very much not settled science. So um, yeah, I, I hope that it can be, that, that some more sense can be made out of it than this, than the way I present it. But maybe there's us, hopefully I'll get to talk about in the next 19 minutes. Um, so kind of the second answer for where this, this bizarre stuff comes from is kind of from, um, rather than sort of from analysis from some more kind of geometric way of thinking about this whole setup, um, and um, so what kind of uh, geometry is going to um, uh, uh, let us see this, this batch operator? Well, again, it's just kind of geometry series and then modular spaces of vacua. Um, so again, I want to do the minimally uh, general um, setup. So I'm just going to explain all of these notions in the particular examples we've uh, looked at. So the kind of basic um, player in this sort of geometry is something called the affine Grassmannian for GLN. So what is this saying in some very down to earth terms? Um, so we consider the um, field of formal Laurent series in some variable Z. Now, now kind of divorcing your mind the Z from the old spectral family. Just think of it as like, 
like the uniform measure of some. Um, um, and we're going to take the n-dimensional vector space over that, over that field. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, lattices inside of there um, of rank n um, over the ring of integers. Uh, so over the ring of formal um, Taylor series, um, power series. So that's um, the fine grass money for, for GLN. Okay. Uh, and so, so some infinite dimensional, um, um, dimensional pieces. Um, and to describe, and those sort of finite dimensional pieces, you can kind of nicely describe um, by putting conditions on how the lattice L. Uh, kind of sits in relative position to the kind of standard lattice. So it's called a standard lattice L sub zero, where we just take the direct sum of n copies of the Taylor series ring. Um, and so sitting inside of this uh, GLN, we have some nice finite dimensional smooth sub variety, G omega k, where a is a fundamental representation of um, GLN. Just think of it as a, a name, um, if you like. And this thing here consists of lattices L uh, that are contained in the standard lattice. Um, and they, moreover, if I take the standard lattice and multiply it by Z, uh, this should be contained in L. So L is kind of sandwiched in between L sub zero and uh, Z L sub zero. And um, what's more, we can just take the complex vector space we get by taking L modulo L zero, and we demand that this complex vector space have dimension K, right? So this is some um, finite dimensional uh, smooth projective variety, and we can even say which one it is. It's just more to the grass finite, grass manian of um, um, K points in L zero mod Z L zero, which is C to the N. All right, great. Um, so uh, as we know, these gross monies have some natural uh, tautological line bundles on them. Um, well, a natural tautological line bundle for each one. Um, uh, and that line bundle is just the, the determinant of the kind of tautological vector bundle um, where we remember this quotient of L0 mod L. Um, Okay, great. So to um, so, so now we've in some sense defined the geometry of a pure gauge theory. Now we have to add in this by fundamental matter, and to do that, um, right? Oh, yeah, does that matter? So let's define a new um, space T, and now what is this? What are points of T going to consist of? Well, they're going to consist of uh, triples, um, L, M, and phi. What are all these things? Well, L is going to be a point in GLN. So lattice um, uh, in GLM, in GLN. M is going to be in GLM. And phi is going to be um, a, if you like, an N by M matrix with uh, formal power series coefficients, HOM CN. CM, bracket, bracket Z. Um, and we impose a condition that phi should carry L into M. Right? So these lattices um, and this sort of uh, matrix phi are not just kind of uncorrelated. Phi has to send the first lattice into the second lattice. Great. All right. So this thing. Uh, um, obviously has GLN cross phi, probably like a sort of um, infinite rank vector bundle um, where the fibers are given by all possible values of this matrix phi. Um, okay, and we have to do just one more thing, um, which is to um, define some 
uh, uh, so, so the, the variety we really care about is kind of cut out of this uh, vector bundle um, by some uh, equations. And uh, those equations are the following. So let's say that we have our L, M, and phi uh, in T. And the condition now is in, a, in addition to sending L into M, phi has to send the standard lattice L0 uh, um, into the standard lattice M as well. In other words, that the entries of phi have to be actually formal Taylor series, not formal Lorentz series. Okay. Um, great. Uh, and again, this thing projects GLN cross GLM. And we're going to be interested in, um, we could say R uh, omega K, um, comma omega L. This thing here um, is a fiber over um, the corresponding um, loci in the uh, F. Lang Grassmannians of GLN and GLM. Okay. Um, and we also have. Uh, pulled back from kind of either factor. Um, so one pulled back from the GLN factor, um, L2 pulled back from the GLM factor. Okay, so now, um, what's the point of all this stuff? Um, well, Braverman, Finkelberg, and um, now, Kojima explained that um, so this um, R is an action um, of GLN cross GLM, and just call that G for short, um, uh, formal Taylor series. And these guys explained how to make sense of the um, P formal Taylor series equivariant K theory of. Of R, which basically involves cutting it out of this vector bundle T. Um, and ever solution. Um, um, and it's by the classes, all classes of the form. Um, so we take the straw of these of like R, omega, and then omega prime. Um, and now, uh, and then we have to potentially twist by some of these um, tautological uh, line bundles. So where does it live? Is a fundamental, as I say, is a minuscule, um, which in this case is fundamental uh, weight, co weight of GLN, omega prime, same for GLM, and overall integers. Okay. In algebra um, and a set of generated. Um, these things are what's often called minuscule Even better than just um, this thing's actually a uh, cluster. Uh, um, and there are kind of two natural. Uh, um, Initial clusters. Um, let me describe uh, what they are. It's just sort of cluster one um, that consists of the following um, elements. So let me just sort of do the usual abusive notation and, and call the structure sheaf of some um, sub variety by just said sub variety. So we have R um, omega i uh, zero, 
Um, and the same thing, uh, but now tensed with uh, this, this line bundle. And then, um, so all this, um, uh, so we have those guys, and then we also have um, uh, R zero uh, comma omega J and star, and then R zero comma omega J star tensored with this line bundle L two. Okay, and what is omega J star? This is like you know minus W naught times um, two omega. J. All right, so this is one um, natural initial cluster. Um, and there's another one um, where we basically just swap around um, uh, the roles of who is uh, dualized and who is, who is not. Well, we're not dualized, but yeah. Um, uh, so we have two um, natural initial clusters. Sorry, like sorry. what, what uh, do you mean by if, initial cluster? You mean initial seed or, or what? Yeah, in, initial seeds, yeah. Right, so so uh, each of these things, um, it's a class in K3, so it's a function on the Coulomb branch. And I've, I've given two collections of special collections of, of functions, each of which kind of forms an initial seed um, for the same cluster algebra. Right, and, and what this really comes from, right, is, is the fact that the BSN construction Um, only depends on the representation direct sum with the dual representation. Um, and so, so this cluster one kind of naturally comes from HOM from CN to CM. This one comes from HOM from CM to CN, comes from the kind of dualization. And the point is that the Baxter operator um, sends one cluster to the other. Okay, um, so to, to show this, you only, th this actually just follows from the Whittaker identity. Um, uh, that I uh, described uh, earlier. Um, but uh, it turns out actually that kind of um, there's, um, Right, right. So, so the Whittaker identity is enough to say what this big composite of mutations does, but you can actually say what happens at each step of the way, uh, which I think is also kind of cool. Um, so in the last five minutes, I want to spend describing the kind of bizarre combinatorics of that. Um, and right. Um, Okay, so, so sort of in fact, um, you can track um, the effect of each mutation um, in the sequence. And it turns out that each intermediate cluster uh, consists entirely of these minuscule multiples. And what I now want to do is explain the kind of combinatorics of which minuscule multiples appear at which, which stage of the, the game. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's dive right in, in an example. Um, and to sort of see the pattern, I think it's, you have to do a fairly big example, um, which in this case is KL4 cross KL4. Um, Okay, so uh, what is going on in these um, pictures here? So again, we have our familiar looking quiver describing the cluster structure. And um, I'm gonna enumerate it in the way I um, failed to do correctly in my uh, Java file, uh, which is we start at the top, we go along the zigzag path, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Um, and then we follow backwards along the zigzag path, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six. Then just as we did before, we unroll this thing kind of onto the uh, universal cover. 
So again, in the in the top row along here, I have uh, things that project to um, vertex six. In the next row, things project to vertex five, things that project to vertex four, three, two, one, and so on. Okay, so now let me zoom in um, and explain what this picture represents. So remember, each square in this picture corresponds to doing a mutation at uh, some particular uh, vertex. Okay, and so what we see along the kind of boundary um, of this green square, these things are exactly the variables in their initial cluster. So, so what my notations mean is when I um, say something like, um, like this, I mean R zero comma omega one star tensed with L1, tensed with L2, okay? Um, and the fact that this appears in the, the square corresponding to six means that the cluster variable associated to that node was literally that, that function on the modular space. Okay. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so the way to read this picture is that along the kind of these two edges of this green square, I have my initial data. And then as I do each of these uh, mutations in my, um, uh, that constitute my period, this initial data um, gets transformed into um, what eventually stands on the other two uh, edges of the rectangle. And these, like up to some annoying twist by the determinant, are the functions of my final cluster. Um, right, so instead of having, you know, zero three star, I now have zero comma three over here. And over here, there's this annoying business about twisting around the determinant, but it's basically um, what you want. Okay, and um, so uh, and so, uh, what is the kind of um, yeah? And so the way one um, uh, kind of reads this picture, right, is that um, as as you scan along the um, rows of the picture, you track the evolution of each corresponding um, uh, cluster variable. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, so at, at time zero, the cluster variable for three is zero comma two star, it then mutates to three comma two tensor rel two, then to three comma three tensor rel one, then to two comma three tensor rel two, then to two comma four tensor rel one. All right, and you can see how to kind of read the rest of the picture. All right, um, so that's some, again, some kind of Byzantine, um, uh, combinatorial structure. Um, and let me just say one um, tiny word about how um, one uh, sort of proves such a thing. Um, so th this picture, um, so it follows from some basic, uh, basically two basic identities in the Grodendig ring of this um, R uh, variety. Um, and these kind of identities, um, let me uh, just sort of write down one of them. So R kind of omega K, omega L, uh, tensor L1 convolved with R K comma L plus one, uh, tensor L2. This is equal to uh, KL involved with uh, KL plus one, tensor now with both. Um, one bundles. Plus uh, an additional term, which is uh, K. L minus one tensor L two involved with R K plus one L plus one uh, tensor with L one. Um, okay, and um, the uh, at least uh, what seems to be the easiest way to prove these identities, or at least one way to prove these identities, is to notice that they actually come. Um, Uh, uh, from taking the image in the Grotendieck ring of exact triangles 
in um, the derived category of coherent sheaves on this R uh, GLN cross GLN. Okay, so, so in that sense, we kind of get a categorification um, of each of these um, each of these steps along along the way of this Baxter operator. Okay, so I think I'm exactly out of time. We started three minutes after, and now it's three minutes after ninety. So yeah, let me stop there. Thanks. Perfect timing. Thanks, guys. Uh, <laughs> questions. Well, maybe to mm -hmm. warm people up to questions, I'll ask a silly question. So yeah. if I if I look at um, at like the um, usual Schubert calculus or maybe mm -hmm. the K-theoretic Schubert calculus, then uh, so this is okay. There's some way to understand it, but also if you would like to do the Schubert calculus in the style of uh, like maybe uh, Paul Zinn and, and Alan mm -hmm. Knudsen. Then yep. you're gonna get into some like a second kind of level discrete integrable system that has to do with how to transform. Sure. Mm -hmm. Even visually, it looks a little bit like a triangle. Yeah. So right. Is I mean, there think... is there some hidden right right in your sequence of mutation? Is there some hidden or maybe explicit discrete integrable system that uh, that tells you how yeah, how this that's right. Evolve? So so I think the really the correct way to draw this picture is kind of actually three dimensional rather than two dimensional, um, because I, like I've really been kind of confusing the time direction with the space direction when I've drawn this picture, um, in that I've like initially rolled the picture out onto the cylinder, and then each of the uh, nodes that lives over the six in this initial picture they really should have the same function attached to them, and then to go to the next stage we should really do some like local transformation. So if I want to do this mutation here, I should do some local transformation here, which should like add kind of a, a step onto that surface to get to the next layer of the three dimensional picture. And then you should sort of keep going until you build your way up to the whole thing. So I think it, it, it's like, um, yeah, the, the analogy is with this like um, Q system. Um, picture where you have this kind of stepped surface around each, each that looks kind of like an egg carton egg carton stacked on top of each other, where at each stage you kind of push up the sort of alcove in the egg carton um, up one part. So that's probably the right way to draw this picture, but... Um, is yeah. this an analogy or it's an actual match or it's something new which is, looks like the Q system? Or is it... It's something new which looks like the Q system, yeah. I mean, the Q, I, I can say what the Q system is. It's actually really simple stuff. Um, so Q system just corresponds to mutating at all of the for instance, sources in a quiver like this, um, or all the sinks if you want to go backwards in time. Um, right, so that's Q system. This thing is some other bizarre kind of, I mean, it commutes with the Q system, um, but it's um, some additional thing that you get from having these, um, well, first of all, having this kind of handle and second of all, having another GLM attached. But yeah, I, I hope eventually to have some nice three-dimensional picture I can try and fail to demonstrate during a subsequent version of this talk. Not then in, in this, uh, in Knuts and Junzostan world, there's mm -hmm. something interesting that happened. They can do like a, you know, whatever partial flag varieties, but up to a certain number of steps. They, uh, it's, yeah, right, right, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, something pretty bizarre. You, yeah, well, I agree. Maybe, maybe I don't have the latest, but is that you yeah. expect something like this to happen in 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 the very general kind of? I, I think this situation? would be completely. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly this is all I describe is true for any GLN and GLM. Um, um, but yeah, um, and, and like I said, like you can kind of also treat the general quiver gauge theory because these DT transformations just sort of commute, um, like it sort of splits up into factor by factor in the, in the representation. So once you've handled one of them, it's um, handled the rest, but yeah. But the direct analogy here would be a linear quiver. So you think you can do the linear quiver of arbitrary length somehow, not... Uh... Oh, ah, I see, I see, I see. Um, yeah, sure, I mean, um, yeah, that, that's like, the, the, the point is that the, op, like really the, what I just described is how to flip the orientation of this arrow. Um, 
how to make it go like that. But the mm -hmm. operator that flips that arrow, just commutes with the one that flips that arrow. So um, it's kind of a bit of a letdown in that respect. It doesn't know, yeah. So as long as Quiver does not have loops, then... Ah, yeah, that's a good point. If you have loops, it's a different stuff. It doesn't even have a cluster DT transformation if it has loops, so... Yeah. Not in terms of sequence implementations. Right, not cluster DT, yeah. yeah. More right. questions? But yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, if, if you start to ask silly questions, I would continue. Uh, By all means. One of the... Uh, one of the starting point uh, in theory of cluster algebras was Grissmanians and yep. uh, in particular works of uh, Posnikov and others on mm -hmm. directed networks, uh, yep. which uh, allows you to represent positive uh, stratas in Grissmanians in a convenient way. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, they got uh, statements about uh, certain uh, minors, uh, which are in fact functions or at least linear right. linear mm -hmm. bundles on Grassmannians mm -hmm. and presented them as some uh, boundary measurements of these networks. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you promote these Grassmannians to affine Grassmannians or uh, I didn't, unfortunately I didn't catch all ah, the sure. geometry of the problem, but right, right. Uh, um, I saw that this is some kind of affine Grassmannian. So, the question is, uh, can you draw this uh, planar network of Posnikov for your, uh, for a Grismanian right. and say what uh, boundary measurements I have to take to obtain your uh, functions or cluster variables? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think such a thing, um, I know of some examples where you can do uh, such a thing, um, but those are examples where I, already knew so for a different reason. So let me describe one of them. Um, so if we, yeah, let's take a, a linear quiver. Um, uh, with dimensions um, just increase linearly with step one and a frozen vertex of, of not frozen, uh, framing of uh, dimension N. Then you can do the whole BFN business here um, and K theory of this R. Um, uh, well, if you um, also work equivalently with respect to the uh, loop uh, rotation, this thing is basically um, quantum group UQ of SL. And, um, and there you really can. Um, 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 write these minuscule monopoles um, um, as um, paths in a in a network, but where you get that network from is kind of a different um, realization of, of, of this guy as a cluster algebra, which, which comes from thinking about um, uh, local systems on an, on an annulus. Um, so you have some kind of annulus with some kind of irregular singularity and um, uh, uh, like this. And then to um, basically the, the way you get a, a network um, is by kind of taking a sort of ideal triangulation of this thing and then drawing a kind of standard network um, in each um, of these um, triangles. Um, yeah. So these sort of familiar kinds of um, uh, pictures. So, so you can definitely draw some network in, in this case, but I, I definitely don't have like a clear picture of how you you um, would do that kind of network combinatorics. For, no. So Asha, do you have any? I think you you were saying you thought about that recently. You know, I think we discussed it, but yeah, we, we don't know how to do it in terms of network because it basically boils down to the question that that, that my father asked whether uh, you you sort of you can mutate everything at full mm. round vertices. And, and yeah, right. Can, but sort of the way you so somehow you mutate it, but the quiver doesn't. You don't start with a planar quiver. Well. Yeah. No. How do I say? It? Yeah, the, the the quiver somehow does not is not planar all the way through. And the question is, can you somehow maybe change the sequence in which you mutate 
to actually represent everything with networks. We hope that you can, but it's not clear at the moment. Yeah. Mm, but but the initial quiver, I think that at least initial quiver which was drawn by Gus uh, is planar. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Cylinder, yeah. Yes. Right. So, so so the weird thing is we have two planar quivers on the cylinder. There's the one that comes from the triangulations, uh, which is this guy here, and then there's the one I drew um, from before. Um, but the problem is that so big, both of these are planar, but the mutations that you um, go from one to the other, these are not these four valent, not, not square moves, not possibly cut moves. Actually, let me be correct my statement. So, so the quivers are planar, but if you want to draw any, to give any network description, you also need frozen variables. And as soon as you add those, then the picture stops being planar. And we hope that we can actually still make it planar, uh, but we don't know how at the moment. So the trouble really in what Gus was drawing, if you if you forget about this the cylinder the cylinder and, and the, yeah this character variety description, um, the problem really comes from from adding frozen variables there. Um, mm -hmm. I see, I see. Thank you. More questions. Last last call for. Oh. So again, I just want to make it clear. Uh, this is mm -hmm. this relation which you written uh, above uh, the last relation probably in your talk, uh, which mm. looks yeah, like yeah, this, short, this one here. Short, yeah. Is it is mm -hmm. it is it certain short Blucher relation or not? Well, I guess I I so, so I guess can I perhaps try and rephrase the question in the following way? So perhaps is. Is it possible to form a matrix whose entries consist of functions on the Coulomb branch such as it, so that this relation is a short Blucher relation among the miners of that matrix? Um, and the answer to that question is, I don't know. Um, it would be very nice if that were um, true, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, like, like it seems to me like the easiest way to prove it is just to directly construct the triangle, um, which is not very hard to, which is sort of very geometrically natural. Thing to do, but yeah, perhaps there's some just algebraic way you can prove it by realizing it is a either a short Blucher relation or a Jacobi Denonneau identity or one of those like three term determinant identities. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, more questions. If uh, there's no more questions, I thank both Gus and Sasha, who Sasha is <laughs> on this and he's on, the, he's on this call. Let's thank them both for, uh, for this presentation today and we'll meet again next week, election day. We still have the seminar, so we'll see everybody there. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.